The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. So optimizing queries with MySQL Explain. Um, explain is an SQL extension. Yeah, see, that's good enough. It's just lopping off the Firefox logo. Um, it's an SQL extension. It's select only, except in 5.6. In MySQL 5.6, you can actually do an explain on inserts, updates, and deletes as well. Uh, before MySQL 5.6, since that's not even in beta yet, um, you can modify other statements, like you can modify an update statement to be a select statement. Um, you put the word explain right in front of the select statement, and that's how it happens. What it shows, it shows how many tables are used, how many tables are joined, how data is looked up, and if there are subqueries, unions, and sorts. It shows if you use a where clause, it shows if you use the word distinct. It shows the possible and actual indexes used, the length of the index that's actually used, the approximate number of records examined, um, and then it uses metadata about the cardinality and stuff, so if you are using um, a storage engine like EnoDB that has approximate metadata, you're going to get not as good of an optimization plan as if you use MySQL with exact data. Of course, MySQL has its own problems. So uh, this is what the output of explain looks like. Is this similar to what you, you're used to um, seeing? Yeah, and yeah. So this is what it looks like. The first row is just the ID. It starts with one, then goes to two, three, four, that kind of thing. Select type. We'll talk about that. That's just a, so it's a sequential identifier. Select type is either simple; it's either one table or you know joins. Then you could have primary, which is the first select in the union or the outer query of a subquery, and then you have union and union result um, and things like. So that's what like a union would look like. It has primary union, and then union result is like the third kind of ghost table there. Other ones are dependent union, dependent subquery, derived and uncacheable subquery. Um, the table is the table name or alias used. So one thing is I, a lot of people in their code will alias things like T1 and T2, and that gets really tough in an explain plan. You're like, I've got seven things here. What's PQRS again? Um, and you know, you'll have a null table if you don't actually have a table reference. Type is the data access method. This is what you want to get as good as possible, and uh, this is where you look at a reference sheet, or this is where the presentation gets to be an hour long of explaining all the different types. So you have all, which is a full table scan, index, which is full index scan range. You know, so I go through all this kind of stuff. One important thing about MySQL, so here's an example of a range query, uh, you know, where rental date between this and that, but why isn't this one a range query? Do, you, do either of you guys know why this bottom one is not a range query? So you said, because it doesn't know to transform one query to the other. No, I mean, if you type this in and explain select rental ID from rental, it wouldn't show you range. Time zone dependent? Nope, not time zone dependent. Someone who's a MySQL, Tim, do you know why? This bottom one isn't, oh man. It's because MySQL does not have materialized views, and therefore it also does not have functional indexes. So it cannot actually take this date of rental date. This, this is just, it has to go through every single rental date, apply the date function, so it can't use an index on it. Uh, Maria DB does have uh, what it's called virtual columns, right? Which um, can be persistent or not, so it does have materialized views in that kind of a way. It materializes, and you can use functional indexes in Maria DB, that was the comment. So MySQL doesn't have this yet, um, but it, I don't see it on the roadmap for 5.6, but MariaDB does have it in version 5.2, which is a 5.1 compatible MySQL. Uh, so more types, index subquery, unique subquery, these are things you might see, index merge, you know, this is all going, um, you know, ref or null, full text, ref, EQ ref, this is all going in terms of worst to best. So the worst of the full table scan, I talked about that first. The fastest one is const and system. Um, there's also constant propagation. So for example, in here, we have an explain, says return date, explain return date, first name, last name from rental, inner joint customer, using customer ID where rental ID equals 13534. So what it does is it looks at the rental table first, it uses the primary key, which happens to be on rental ID, it reads one row, and then what it does is, is then it joins it to the customer table, but because this is on a primary key, 
So at max, it's going to return one row. The explain plan actually knows that it's going to have a constant here because it knows at most it's going to have one row returned from this part of the query. So it's, this is called constant propagation because the constant is propagated because it, there's at most one customer ID because it's a primary key, which is unique, not null. No, I'm sorry? The comment was there's no increase in cardinality. Right, because this is a primary key. If this was not a primary key, if it was just an index, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, be a constant propagation, but it would know that it would, it would only propagate an X number of rows, you know, depending on the metadata. Right. It, it's, it's basically like it finds that it would, yeah. It would, find, it would find the customer ID, let's say the customer ID f with this rental ID is two, it would then basically do the query instead of doing a join, that's absolutely right. Um, the comment was it doesn't do a join, and he's right. It doesn't, instead of doing a join, they'll find the customer ID and then look in the table for that customer ID. So it's, it actually removes the need to do the join. There's also no data access strategy, which is technically the fastest. So if you do, again, like select one plus two, that doesn't have a data access strategy because it's not accessing any data. Um, there are indexes that shows you the possible keys, the actual key it used, and then the key length. So one of the ways that you can debug a query is you can say, why isn't it even trying to use, why is this index that I think it should use, it's not even in the possible keys. You can kind of debug it that way. Um, and then the number of rows is approximate number of rows examined. Um, and if you use a limit, it doesn't actually change that. Even though like if you did limit 10 here, it would stop after it got to 10 rows, so it would only examine X number of rows until it got to the 10 that that do it, and in this case, there's no where clause. So we know that it would examine 10 at most, right? Um, so yeah, so it, even though it affects the number of rows that are actually examined, in the explain, that doesn't. Uh, right, limit is, the comment is limit was, is applied afterwards, so you might actually have to do that. In this query, it's not, because there is no sorting or filtering, but that, you're absolutely right, and that's why explain doesn't show that, because it can't. Does it change the plan if there is a limit? No, because the limit is applied afterwards. Or rather, it's applied after the plan is made. The plan is made without regards to limit, and then when the execution happens, the limit is applied. So you don't actually have to do all of it. So you can kind of get a false execution, uh, query plan because of that limit. Yeah, and then there's extra, there's more stuff. There's a field called extra, which you know has a bunch of stuff, whether you're using where, whether you're using distinct, whether you're using no tables, whether you have impossible where, notice after reading const tables. What that means, if you have something where like you have an auto income ID and you say like where ID is negative four, it will know that the ID values go from one to 100, so negative four isn't even a possible value. It'll say impossible where notice after reading const tables. That doesn't mean it's bad, it just means I know that I won't be able to satisfy your query without even having to go to the data. There's also not exists all this kind of stuff. There's lots and lots of stuff where you should, um, you know, you'll just look at the manual, because I just wanted to give an, a short example before we talk about like the limit, the limitations and all that kind of stuff. Um, MySQL isn't so good with subqueries. Back when subqueries were first put in in 4.1, um, MySQL treated every single subquery as a dependent subquery, which means that for every row in the outer query, it ran the inner query once. Um, which is usually not how you want it, especially because it has kind of, the inner query has parentheses around it, so you kind of want it to be mathematical. You want it to say, oh, well, I will, um, I will run this statement once and then go to, um, and then get the answer and do kind of like the constant prop propagation. That's kind of how you want it to be. So uh, subqueries are getting better all the time. MariaDB has some really good subquery optimizations in 5.3, which is, again, a 5.1 compatible um, MySQL. And uh, you can also explain partitions and explain extended. Explain extended adds a filtered field. It's called filtered, which is an approximate percent of how many of ex the examined rows will be returned. So for example, here's an explain extended, um, you know, rows 326, but filtered is 75.15. So it's about how many, about 75% of the rows it actually looks like will be returned. If that filtered is low, you might want to be like, well, why wouldn't you return most of what you're using? Is there not a good index? That kind of thing. Um, so yeah, there's a, more information in other places. Um, so that's all I have on that. The, um, I do have some of the optimizations in 5.6. Um, I already said the insert updates and deletes. 
um, can be used as, as um, select queries. You can also, instead of getting it in that table format that I showed, you can get it in JSON format, which would be nice if you are a developer and want to kind of put that in some kind of, I don't know, you want to do something JSON-y with it, you can do that. Um, there's also a better subquery optimization. So it's coming in 5.6. It's already in MariaDB 5.3. Um, and then you also have, uh, with one of the biggest ones is having an optimizer trace. So what you can do is you can run a query and it will tell you every possible plan it looked at. So you can see, like, did it look at this plan but not actually, um, not actually implement it. Let me see if I can find a manual page on it. Um, you also have better statistics. You can see, did it consider joining this? Did it consider doing a prune? What did it consider? Um, so you could do something like run a MySQL 5.6 slave that's um, not in production, it's just a slave, and then you can kind of run queries against it to say, you know, what the optimization for it would be in 5.6, and then you can apply it back, even if your master is 5.1 or something like that. So you can kind of use it as a DBA slave. Um, MySQL optimizer trace explain. I should probably put 5.6 in there. MySQL internals optimizer training, here we go. Yeah, tracing capability has been added to the MySQL optimizer. Let's see if we can find a quick example. Um, you're welcome, have a good one. Let's see if I have internets. I do have internets. So here's the trace table. You get the query, the trace and trace in JSON format, missing bytes beyond maximum size, missing privileges. So here's how, let's see. I'm just trying to see if we can get an example. Do I have an example? Here's an example. Tracing of order and group by simplification. So here's an insert. It inserts a bunch of things, creates, inserts. Now we look at the trace. So yeah, it looks like you have to kind of spend some time with it. It's definitely a JSON format. Join preparation, condition processing, original condition, transformation. So it's a lot of information here that you didn't get before, which is kind of neat. Um, but now I want to turn it over. If you want to talk a little bit about um, Explain and Postgres. Well, I was hoping Bruce would be back because I, mean, I can actually show you some explains, but Bruce really actually had some explains and stuff. So I'm curious if we're going to have a time to discuss. Sure. So the question is, if you're, you know, doing, say, load testing and you hey, fire, this, fire the same query over and over and over, um, does MySQL redo the execution plan or the mm -hmm. optimizer stuff for every single time you run that? Oh, I believe the answer is yes. Know. I believe it does every single Sorry. time. Okay. Um, every single time you do it, I believe that happens. No, no. There's no compilation or anything like that. It, unless you're using the query cache, but then okay. it doesn't do any execution every month. If it's the exact same query, yeah. There's no kind of compiling of the query plan that it does. There's parameterized queries, but that's different. And that does cache it, but there, but that's only once per session anyway. So if you, if there's a, like you have not using connection pooling, so you're doing like, you know, PHP or Python without connection pools, and you just connect, run the query and go back, you're actually gonna have extra overhead. So, so great. Okay. Um, yeah, so I didn't realize I actually. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined 
that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. 
and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments we started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers lots of QA lots of users actually using it high availability is the key feature, uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. <laughs>